So welcome everybody. Today we have the great pleasure of talking to harpsichord builder John Phillips and Janine Johnson, um, who has worked with John for many years doing painting of instruments, uh, making keyboards and doing all the decoration, um, especially on these fine harpsichords. Um, John's shop is in Berkeley, California, uh, and he, he is represented with several instruments in Houston. A couple live at the University of Houston. I have one in my living room, as you can see right behind me. Uh, there's one at St. Philip Presbyterian Church, where Ars Lyrica offices and rehearses. And this instrument uh, that we're going to be looking at today is heading its way to Houston because I finally decided to get myself a German single manual instrument with uh, what we call a full Janine. That means to say <laughs> a lot of decoration. <laughs> A rather nice paint job um, on this instrument. Yeah, it's okay. Um, so John and, and Janine are both with us. Um, we, we are going to be looking at uh, some pictures of their shop, um, in which they have a couple of instruments, and finding out how an instrument like this is put together. I'm John Phillips. Uh, I've been doing this for uh, several decades. I've, I've lost track how many decades. Well, now. since I've been working for you for 35 years, yeah, Janine's more than for me three. For 35 years, and I was, <laughs> and I'd already been doing it for a while. So when she showed up, so um, since the mid 70s. So this is, yeah, I, I actually started in officially in 1975. So uh, we've made a large number of instruments. I like to think um, there are two people working for me, um, and Janine's the longest termed one. Uh, there's another member of our shop, Dominic Pavia, who's... Uh, it's going on three years, isn't he? Who is going on, he's now been here for three years, and he's here, he's here three days a week. And during this, this crazy COVID crisis, uh, he's only here in some, three afternoons, and he'll be coming in later today. And, but we'll see some of his handiwork. Um, he's actually a trumpet player who moonlights as a harpsichord maker. So we'll start with, should we start with the shop? Yes. Going sure. into the shop? Okay, so this is, this is our, our main shop and with wood stacked along against the wall, bending form, various sorts of machines, benches. Okay, so what this is, is exactly the same instrument as Matthew's. Um, and I'll credit Dominic with having done approximately 95% of the work on this so far. Uh, on the case, yeah. I mean, I'm making so the keyboard. And so it's just like Matthew's. There's a fine bottom. There are poplar sides. There's a big chunk of maple that will be the rest plank. Um, a bit of spruce. A little and blue tape. And some blue tape. <laughs> a piece uh, of paper towel. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> and uh, so it's ready now for some interior veneer. Yeah, there's some yeah, this just maple. sitting out there with blue tape on it. You cannot make harpsichords without blue tape, it turns out. That's right. They had it in the 17th century. So it this is an instrument very much like, it's, I say it's the same model as Matthews, uh, for a, a young fellow in New York. And it's, we're really lucky to be able to do two of them right on top of each other so, before we forget how to make them. Because uh, each one of them has its own idiosyncrasies. Yeah, they have they have formulas. They don't have yeah. drawings. We actually make instruments. We often make instruments that are copies of ancient ones. Uh, and for example, the Matthews other instruments are pretty much all copies. Uh, these aren't. These are something that sprung from uh, Minerva. Minerva, well, I'm not Minerva, but whatever. Maybe you're uh, Zeus. <laughs> uh, and they're based on the work of a particular family of instrument makers who worked in Dresden from the end of the 17th century through well into the 19th century. Um, they started out, out mainly as organ builders, but they were also uh, closely associated with the Saxon court. Uh, one of them studied organ with Bach, and the name is Gravener. Um, and so Johann Heinrich Gravener, Johann Christian Gravener was a Bach student. Uh, they were organists at one of the big churches in Dresden, the Frauenkirche. And once they were, uh, also with the, with the court associations, they were the official tuners 
So for example, when Bach came to Dresden in 1717 to compete with, with Marchand, this famous time, he probably played a Gravener instrument and, and Johann Heinrich Gravener the Elder probably tuned for him. So I'm making this up. We don't know, but it's very likely. And so there are, there are four instruments that survive, four harpsichords that survive from this family. And my favorite one of the old ones was the earliest, which was made by the same Johann Heinrich Gravener the, the Elder uh, in 1722, which is now in, in a museum in Prague. And it's a very interesting instrument in a lot of ways, unlike anything else I'd ever seen. And the single manual ones are based on the design principles that are evidenced in that, on that one. Uh, the way the strings are laid out, various, various other things, the scaling we call, as we call it, uh, certain elements of the action, certain elements of the interior construction, but there's no real antecedent for them. It's something that, that I've made up. And we've done, this is now, uh, Matthews is the third, this is the fourth single, and these two are the only two that are, that are the same. Um, so with this, this instrument is almost ready for a soundboard. Uh, Janine, who has, been, who has been busily uh, decorating uh, Matthew's instrument, is now starting in on, on the keyboards. And for, for this one as well, we always use the word keyboards in the plural. Uh, <laughs> even though it's even a though, single. Even though this one just has one. The keyboards always, it's one of those thing like, things like pants. They seem to be only available in the plural. Yeah, this is sort of the low res version of a keyboard. Yes, this is where you can play only one note. <laughs> so they start out. <laughs> My poor hand. So they start out. This is panel. why it's a board. This is a panel, and what she's done is drawn out the the keyboard and glued the, the top, which is this is ebony tops on it. And the next thing that will happen to this is it'll get cut out. And made into individual keys, right? And it, and it fits on the key frame, which is this item. This this these are our balance our balance our balance pins here. The, the, where they rock on this is a rack for, which guides the, the back. The back and typically German. This is quite solid because we're German here. Well, actually, we're not. Yeah, they're, they're complicated. Well, because of the angle that the gap is angled, you notice that it's not parallel. It's like an Italian keyboard where it's shorter in the treble than in the bass. And, and then they, it's all done by math. It's 40, the balance point is 42% of the length of the key. For, so you have to figure out where the balance point is in order to figure out where to put the balance rail so that the pins end up in the wood and not in the air. <laughs> And what that is is a four to three ratio. So four, three for the balance to give a correct uh, weight and rapidity of repetition and all these things. And they liked numerology. And they've and these things are the the basic design of the instrument is uh, is actually a Fibonacci relationship. Of, uh, so the the width is two and the, and the length is five. So they do. The Germans like to do things like that. In fact, almost all old instruments have some sort of, of constructive geometry that, that from which the shape is derived. And uh, that's, that's actually the basis for, for the, the size of the instrument. Everything else just falls into place from that. So maybe Janine, you can say what you're gonna play. Well, I, I came up with a, a, a motley assortment of things into the sort of sweet that keeps changing key. Uh, yesterday, we, we had, John wanted me to play this F major uh, boom Alamon, and I've been working on the Bach French Overture, and which is in B minor, and that's tritone part, and it was really air racing. So filled in the gap with D minor and D major, and plus now you get to have all your sounds on the harsh support, starting with the back eight.
maybe while Janine's there, Janine, could you explain to us uh, the process that you went through to decorate this instrument? How do you achieve that tortoise shell finish? Oh, it's many layers. Um, you start with uh, a light ground, of, it's kind of a pale yellow ochre, and then sand that, and then on top of that, you sponge um, kind of a light burnt orange. It ends up looking like a, a fancy squash. It's, I call it the pumpkin stage, where, where that's modeled. And it gets sanded, and it gets uh, amber shellac painted over it to sort of tone it down a little bit. And then there's a coat of a lighter red, which is uh, it's like a, a red ochre mixed with a burnt sienna. It's Venetian red and cadmium maroon specifically. Um, and the light red gets brushed on. You see these funny little brush strokes. This is in black, but these um, it gets brushed on and these little swoopy strokes looks a little bit like Hebrew writing. And there's S's and M's and C's and dots. And so you paint, paint that on, you brush that on, you sand the heck out of it. And um, then you do a dark red, which is the same pigments, but um, and then you, you do the same thing with the squiggly brush strokes overlapping the old ones. Sand the heck out of that and then do orange shellac over those. And after that, then you go to the black. And the black is uh, varies in shade. You can see that here it's really obvious on this middle panel. Where the, the black is thin, it's um, it looks more brown, and where it's thick, it's more black. And so you get a model's quality from just how thin the paint is. You try not to let it drip, which it can do. So it's just really annoying. Then after that's done, it's lightly sanded and then another coat of amber shellac. So, um, and then it's varnished and sanded to be more smooth before the actual decoration goes on it. Because you're building up all these millions of brush strokes and they end up, um, you know, the paint has thickness and they pile up a little bit. So they, we want to avoid that. And it's a wonderful as, effect. Yeah, it is a neat effect, it's, it's fun. It, it's really fun when the sun hits it. <laughs> yeah, there'll, be a, there'll be a point, Matthew, where the light will hit it in such a way that you almost don't see the gold, and it looks like it's molten lava with the gold sort of floating on it. Yeah. It's very, that's it's, the smoke. <laughs> it's, very, it's very cool. So, the sulfur fumes. Yeah, so, and you can also see now we've got the keyboard. Uh, it's the G, G to D range with um, missing a low low A flat, which Bach uses exactly once and, or, sorry, twice. And uh, Ebony Naturals, Bone Top Sharps, it's a typical Dresden style keyboard. And that's how you'll be presented. And you see the, ba the bottom of your walnut base, which we th were sure it was going to be maple until this morning. Right. And we made it an executive decision. Yeah, I think the wall is, it's, yeah, this it is, goes this better with sense. the decoration. Janine, could you um, tell us what kind of process you go through to create those lovely flowers and the, the gold um, borders around everything, all the, well, the decorative elements? The gold borders uh, are masks. I'll mark a line and 
and put masking tape, uh, either magic tape or, or masking tape, masking blue tape up to the line to make them as much parallel as possible and at an even distance from whatever it is I'm measuring from. And um, that's actually a gold paint. It's uh, made by Signcraft and it's called metallic gold. And we've actually found that it's a really nice paint. It's, uh, you have to stir it a lot because the pigment, which is ground up bronze powder, settles to the bottom of the can a little bit quickly. So that's the lines and the moldings. And then for the actual flowers and all that stuff, um, and, and there's some of the, like, I don't know, John was focusing on the lozenges, the, the rounded part of the lozenges, that's freehand. Um, but the flowers and stuff, they're also freehand, and you paint a uh, gold size, which is a kind of varnish that dries from the inside out. I mean, most varnishes, if you paint a varnish on, it'll skin over. And gold size doesn't skin over, it stays, um, it just gets tacky. <laughs> and when it's reached that tacky stage, which is just right and not gooey, um, at that point, you can take a soft brush with various shades of bronze, aluminum, and copper powder, depending on what color I want. Um, oh, actually, on the, John's looking at the, the lid. The, the first thing I did on the lid was kind of imagine where the flowers are gonna go so that even though the lid is in shadow, um, the gold glints will sparkle it up. So basically, <clears throat> this is a process that's not that far from fresco. You're dealing with a surface that's tacky, that has uh, some paint, some, some resin uh, <clears throat> on it already, and you're doing it at exactly the right moment when it's just tacky enough to actually put in that bronze powder and work with it in some way. Yeah, I've never done fresco. Right? I mean, the, the scratching is like chiaroscuro, where you scratch yeah. through to the, what's underneath. The, um, the last step, which is a little subtle, is uh, I take a tinted shellac and add, add shading. In, in certain lights, it shows better because it changes the, changes the quality of the paint. There's some good ones in these, these leaves. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the shellac, that, that's the last step before, and then it gets varnished. Well, and also, of course, it gets cleaned up because it also, the bronze powder tends to stick to everything else. And Windex works really well to wash the background. Huh. So, and it doesn't, it doesn't tarnish the, the powders either. And it all has to be done fairly, you know, within a couple of weeks because the, the brass, you know, the bronze powders will tarnish. Right. The, uh, the gold leaf doesn't tarnish, but everything else will tarnish and you don't want the decoration to turn dark. Hmm. So that's basically how it's done. And John is saying the back of the instrument as well right now. So we'll just have a look, see. Yeah. Ooh, wow. So different metals. Full view of the top. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is a combination of aluminum, bronze powder, and some of the bronze powder is kind of green. It's pre-tarnished. So the leaves get a lot of the green. And so that's white. Here's a mixture. The flowers are white and the berries are varying shades of, of copper. There's an antique copper that's kind of purple and when you varnish it, it turns a beautiful uh, brown. And this one is a mix of brass and copper. You can see the, uh, the lava trying to go through. <laughs> so, um, ooh, the orange is well lit. So, the orange. Ooh, that's lovely is uh, the flowers have aluminum powder. The aluminum powder is the whitest thing. And there's also a, I've made a mix of, oh, where is one of the quote unquote blue flowers? Oh dear, this hyacinth. Or I mixed the purple or copper with the aluminum to kind of make a, uh, a uh, it's, it's cooler color. It's not blue, <laughs> but it's, it's trying to be blue. So and you've got a, a nifty big, uh, fancy opium poppy here. Let's see here. Uh, there you go. So, and a dandelion. You have to have weeds. Oops. Now there's the. Let me turn this as the computer was hiding that. Sneak it. 
you get some weeds. That's your weed. And there's another, <laughs> Very nice. There's a wild turnip somewhere. It's another weed. I don't remember where I put it. There's an Ep Epipactus gigantea, which is a Sierra wildflower orchid that I have a fondness for. I tried to make your flowers botanically identifiable, and I uh -huh. massively screwed up with the snow snowdrops. I started to paint them, and I thought, you know, I don't know what they look like. So I looked online, and this is <laughs> looks more like a hybrid between a snowdrop and a and a violet. That's they aren't like this at all. So this is an invented flower. This is a whatever. It's a non-identifiable flower but you have everything else pretty much is i think you can this this is uh love in a mist nigella there we go so it's kind of lacy and not too thick because you wanted this fairly sparse let's see where's another uh -huh. wheat here's another dandelion mm -hmm. and, and where's the wild turnip weeds weeds I guess I didn't put too many weeds in your garden. <laughs> I, think, I think one deserves weeds in their garden. It's realistic. You get bugs. Absolutely. Did I give you a snail? I don't remember, but here's a here's a a fly like creature on the stem. So. Uh huh. Yeah. So anyway, and then it's extraordinary. <clears throat> <laughs> it was fun. It's, yeah. you know, sometimes, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of, it actually turned out to be, we were trying to make it simpler than my decoration. And quite honestly, this is more lozenges than on mine. And because, because we needed to fill the space. So I ended up having to do more of these fussy flowers than <laughs> on mine. Oops. And that mine is just paint. You know, I was able to do my starbursts and things. And so um, anyway, but it, it turned out pretty neat. It's mm -hmm. I kind of, I like it so I like mine better of course naturally <laughs> naturally <laughs> well it's, so, it's going to look great here in the living room um, in Houston yeah, and wet. on stage. <laughs> Exactly. Maybe for purposes of comparison, you could just give us a quick shot of the very Lutheran looking instrument that sits next to it, yep. the double manual oh, Grebner, okay. that's just black. Oops. Matthew, I'm also curious, why do you buy a single manual and you buy a double manual? Is it a different sound altogether? It's a different, slightly different sound. They're a little more practical when you want to use them in chamber playing, for example. They don't take up as much room on the stage. Um, they're, they're easier, easier to move. move. <laughs> um, all of those things appeal to me. Um, and since I have yeah. a couple of double annual instruments of John's available to me already, this one plus one at U of H, it just made more sense to, to go with a single. Yeah, so there you see um, a, a more kind of quintessentially Lutheran instrument. Um, the same builder, uh, this is modeled after the same uh, 18th century builder, um, Grabner, um, a double manual version of the same instrument, but in a more kind of austere mode um, yes. with just black and red decoration. Yeah, so this is, this is actually a copy of the 
1722 grave mirror that's in Prague. And uh, of course the, the real one has been painted, someone painted it white and it looks very silly. But this is the presentation. Um, it can't get really much more severe. You see this well, one has a, black. this one has a few more notes than, than yours. It goes down to F, which are, F to D, which is the size of the largest instruments from the 1720s. Um, but otherwise, it's just, the inside's just the same, where it relies on all the moldings and pretty carvings and whatnot. And see, she shows you the stop levers and things on the inside here. Yours, yours are the, it's the same pattern. It also has the same trick jack rail to keep unauthorized people out. What's this? Yes, and so I'll, I'll show you. This doesn't turn, it slides. And then you lift it, you can then just lift it out. Yours works the same, works the same way. And then mm -hmm. you see the, the jacks um, with their little uh, Canada goose feathers. And yours, again, we could, we could have been showing you this on yours. Um, they were very similar. Mm -hmm. Except there's more here. Except there are more of them. Okay, two more. So that's our, that's our action. And you can see how the coupler, the coupler works on this instrument. Where the, so that's the lower manual, upper manual. If I, then if I couple it, everybody work, plays at the upper stage. This is not upper pole. Now yours, yours doesn't do that. Yours, everything goes up and down. And so you actually have a choice that isn't easily available on the double, and that so is, is that you can play the front eight and the four foot. Mm -hmm. um, and people have asked me, well, why did you why did you use a four foot and a single? I mean, shouldn't it be simpler? And I think the answer is no. It's you you get all these resources, and the only thing you can't do is play some Goldberg variations. Right. Well, and the echo and the French. And overture. you know, some things there are some Italian things that absolutely <laughs> require a double, but much of Fox doesn't. Right. And for continuo, you don't really need a double. And I think you were pointing out that having a lower instrument for conducting is actually easier. Uh, very much so. Um, the big doubles do tend to get in one's way when you've got to uh, <clears throat> keep track of a lot of other players. Um, who are mm -hmm. sort of at the other end of the instrument and all around you? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But well, this away. also yours. Yours is about. This is about the same size as your RT. Mm -hmm. Your your instrument here. Rooker's test count. Rooker's test count. So well, we all know what it is. They are going to know what the RT is. And and um, so it's it will fit in most vehicles. It's a little heavy. I'm not very sorry about that, but you. you know, that should be that shouldn't be a problem. This, you don't dislocate your shoulders picking it up because it's narrower. Yeah, it's 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 a little narrower. This is why I go to the gym so I can move harpsichords. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we see it here, all closed up, the slot board in it. Um, and the way it's lit, at least from this angle, it's yeah. doing a lot of things. Okay, so this is what will hold the the lid closed is that hook. Nice. And actually, while we're at it, we should show you one other thing. So the name board will lift out. It's because it's not for that reason. It's because of these crenels. And so you see that you see if you it's crenellated. You um, see that the the sharps are encased. Yeah, this is one of the features of the of the so Saxon instrument. Cool. And the, <laughs> it looks great. Um, it also means that it's very difficult to lose pencils in behind the keyboard. <laughs> So. so to do that, now this now I can lift this out. Yes, I didn't catch that, but okay. This is I look. I just lifted out the transposing channel. I'm going to set it. Mm -hmm. Are you going to move it up to high pitch? And I'm going to move it up to 440 by just sliding the keyboard over. And then he's going to tuck stick that this in. This back in on this end. So there's now two on the left. And now what I'm going to do is I'll look this upside down. But here, turn it over. <laughs> if I slide this over. He's got he's got it marked where we the the crenelled part slides this molding okay. part this Perfect. slides so it's now slid to the right so what this, she, she's explaining 
is that I've marked it here. One is 440, uh -huh. the direction of 440, the direction of 392. And in the middle, the you center, have to there's a, there's do an alignment. It's mark. Yeah, there's a mark. Yeah, it's hard to do. Okay, there. But so now we've done 440 because we're at 440. Slip the name board it back. It goes now. into these tracks. Let me see if I can get a good angle on the track. I'm going to pull it up again for a sec. See those? Uh, yeah, it's hard to uh -huh. film. Yeah, but there's a track. And, it, and you try to put it in straight across because if you tilt, tilt it, it gets a bit far. Voila. I'm glad to have this demonstrated um, by the two of you on video because putting it into writing would be complicated. It is. I've tried doing it, and it, it, it's like four pages. Yep. <laughs> Uh, I think that's a really great uh, discussion of the instrument and of the shop. It's really nice to see all of the visuals and to find out how this particular instrument works and how the decoration um, was applied especially. Um, it's such a fantastic looking instrument. I, I'm very much looking forward to hearing it. Yeah, great. many thanks for great. your time. Of course. It's great to see you both. We'll see you. Ciao. Okay. Ciao. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.